How are you doing, Pablo? I'm doing well, thanks. How are you? I am good, thank you. Are you ready to be grilled? Yes. <laughs> good. Um, I wanted to explain, first of all, why we have you here. Um, I wanted to get you on this recorded call, this interview, to share with our community. Um, because, uh, you know, I don't want to make you sound old, because you're not, but you've been in the copywriting game for a, a, a solid amount of time. A, a, a 20 years is that right yeah 20 years so uh, you're a seasoned pro um you have been a, a freelance copywriter you've worked in agencies and you've worked in-house so pretty much done everything there is to do as a copywriter and 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 i say probably covered a lot of ground in terms of uh different industries as well and 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 different types and formats long form short form taglines all, all sorts um, so I think, you know, picking your brains is, will be really, really very useful for our community. Um, also, obviously, you are helping now in the community and you're going to be providing feedback. So it's good for people to know the person behind the avatar um, and, to, and to, for you to back it up and understand your story. And obviously, we're going to be really digging into some of areas of your expertise that I think can really help. So on that note, I think the first thing to do would be, it'd be great if you could just give us a, a brief history of your career as a copywriter. Yeah, so um, I started way back in uh, 2001. I worked, my first gig was with a digital ad agency. Um, so uh, I started out working on, my primary client was the Jack Daniels website um, and all their like, their portfolio of brands, all their websites as well. So Finlandia, um, I'm forgetting what the other one's called now, the other big whiskey that they have. Um, but I started out doing that. Uh, that agency started to win more traditional business. So I started writing television spots, radio spots, um, website copy, banner ads, interstitials, back when those were a thing. Um, and basically just got a good all around crash course in advertising. I worked at a couple more traditional agencies after that, uh, worked on both digital and uh, traditional offline advertising. Um, worked on American Airlines, um, Nationwide Insurance, was a, which is a nationwide insurer here in the States. Um, a bunch of other brands that were you know, big brands and, and that work was interesting and it gave me a really good crash course into writing for all different types of medium, media. Um, and then after that, I went client side, I moved to London, and that's how I met you. Um, I went to work for an education company that teaches English all over the world. It's called EF Education First. Uh, we were on the, the global branding team, um, which was a, the, the, the very first branding team that they had. Uh, so I worked specifically on branding, I did a few campaigns with them, spent a couple of years there trying to build, build the brand, which is very challenging for a global brand because you have to get a lot of different marketing departments to kind of agree. Mm -hmm. um, and then I went freelance and started my own company in London um, and did that for about three or four years. Uh, and that's how I started working with you guys. Um, and I worked on uh, Network Rail and Oxfam and Adidas and uh, what was the other one that I was thinking of? Dottle, which I don't know if that service is still around, but it's like the one where you pick up your parcels at the train station. So I got a really good, you know, sort of range of experiences over the course of my career. When my visa ran out, I moved back to the States and got a job with an event marketing company, started working on uh, sort of content generation and thought leadership, as well as internal communications campaigns and marketing campaigns uh, externally for the company. So yeah, I've done a little of everything. Not bad. Not, not a bad first client as well, Jack Daniels, to start your career. Yeah, yeah. Often, right? um, how, how did that how did you land that first job? I mean, how did you get into that first agency? So I did the traditional route of going to university for a degree in advertising, um, where basically it was a glorified portfolio program. Um, I, I basically spent two years building a portfolio, learning how to write, um, was kind of what was lacking. And so when I finally got you know, my degree and I was ready to get out in the world, it took me nine months to get a job. Uh, nine months where I was calling my parents every week asking for a hundred dollars to help me pay the rent. And the we've, all, we've, we've all been there. 
Yeah. <laughs> Some of us are there right now, myself included. But um, yeah, so, so we, you know, I, I kind of spent a lot of time calling everyone I could call. I, I, I must have sent out, gosh, two or 300 um, resumes and, or CVs uh, and portfolios to, to agencies, which is, you know, back in the day, you printed out your portfolio and you mailed that um, to an agency, an agency that you wanted to work at. And, uh, you know, once I actually started seeing what agency HR departments were like, I realized those get stacked up in a corner of the room, or at least they used to back when, before the digital kind of portfolio. Yeah. And, uh, so yeah, I wound up on piles in agencies all over the country and I was getting pretty discouraged and it was literally a friend that I had that I went to school with who got a job at this agency in Dallas, Texas, and recommended me because they were looking for a copywriter. And so I accepted the position for, you know, peanuts. It was a, a very, very low salary, but I was a junior copywriter. I was hungry and I was ready to learn and to get to work. So I think that one thing I would say about that, that I would hope people would take away from that is that it's, it's normal to, for the job search to take a while, especially that first job. Um, and it's daunting, but you'll get there. And if you persevere and you just hang in there. Um, one thing I did manage to do was I found a couple of very small, but you know, um, promising freelance gigs while I was unemployed. Uh, and that kind of kept me going. It kept, it kept my spirits up most more than anything. Um, it, it was just like understanding that I wasn't, wasn't something that I was doing wrong necessarily. It was just, that's the process for, for breaking in. It, copywriting is so broad now because it's not just advertising agencies, uh, oral marketing agencies that have copywriters. Copywriters are in all kinds of places right now and there's always a need for good copies. So. Yeah. I think especially the, the fact that now content is king, right? As they say, um, the content marketing essentially has come about since then. Um, and so long form has, it, it, if that's, you know, part of what you offer, it, it's, it's, there's, there's a wealth of, of demand out there, um, for long form content. Um, yeah. but yeah, it's still, still competitive obviously to get into agencies, but I think a lot of our, our community, our, our learners, are looking to go down the freelance route and, you know, try and get those small gigs and then potentially have the option to do both. I suppose once you have that portfolio, you know, it's, it's tough to, to get the portfolio and it's kind of a catch 22 situation in a way. Um, but once you have it, you have the option to get more freelance gigs, to get agency work, to, to work as a freelancer with agencies, which I think is perhaps more common now than it was back then. Um, I think there's more sort of a hybrid model of agencies like ourselves that work with both in-house and external freelancers, especially now in the time when we're filming this of kind of lockdown and COVID, you know, the world is sort of opened up to the fact that you can work remotely and there's a lot more remote collaboration happening. Um, I'll ask you next question about your, you know, your experience of these being a copywriter, a different type of copywriter, what, what, do you, what would you say are the pros and cons of, let's say, working freelance to start with? Freelance, um, I would say, you know, the obvious one is independence, uh, which can be a bit of a double-edged sword, um, but it is very nice. I was uh, friends with a, a guy at EF, who, uh, this guy, Ben, who was a British freelance designer who worked uh, 60 hour, 70 hour weeks for six months out of the year, saved up money and then took six months off. Mm. And he had worked in the industry, you know, 20 years or so and built up enough of a reputation that his clients understood that that was something he did. And he would come back on the market. And I'd always see on LinkedIn, he would say, okay guys, I'm back in town and ready to work, you know, and he would start getting work. Um, one of the nice things about freelancing is uh, that, that I think is actually, biggest benefit is you get a very close intimate relationship with a client in an agency environment you show up to a meeting to present to three clients with an army of 20 people you know and it's intimidating and it's psychological and it's not to me it's a bit playing dirty sometimes and also as an as a client i'm looking at these you know there's one copywriter and an art director who are presenting an idea to me and there's you know 18 other people at the table whose time is being billed to my account so, you know, when I, when I look at that as a, as a client, I think, well, why am I paying for all these other people? These are the guys with the idea. 
Um, as a freelancer, I love the idea that I go in by myself and I have this one-on-one -on -one kind of rapport with the client that builds trust. Um, you know, and, and over time, the, the more they see your face, the more they get used to you, you become kind of a part of the team. So that I think is the biggest benefit of freelancing. I think, um, flexibility is great too. The, the fact that copywriters need a laptop and they can work anywhere in the world is amazing. Mm. I've, you know, I don't recommend doing this regular, making this a regular thing, but I've worked when I've been on holiday before I've been, you know, away from home on a beach or something. And spent an hour responding to an email, you know, I've never worked more than like two hours when I've been on holiday, but, but it is nice to have that ability to, to work from wherever you need to. And when you build a relationship with a client, you know, you're okay with, with spending an hour or two on a Sunday working for them because yeah. you know, you know, that's a relationship that will pay dividends down the road. Uh, a lot of the, the work that I've gotten has been clients referring me to other clients. So once they find a copywriter they like, it's, you know, you start that relationship and that, that pays, pays off down the road. I think another thing that's nice about freelancing is the variety of work and the variety of industries. I mean, how many different sectors have you and I worked on together? I mean, fashion, you know, financial tech, all these different industries that you can get, you know, sort of touch when you freelance. Mm. Um, and the nice thing about that is like, I remember I did um, a freelance gig early on in my career about five years in that was for a company that built um like prosthetic limbs i think it was and i was like well wow this is a this is an odd one i'm never going to do this again and then like 10 years later i worked for another medical supply company and i was able to say you know yeah i have a little experience in this in this field in this industry so that's really nice um and then i think one of the one of the other things that that is sort of uh unspoken is that freelancers as an industry, freelance copywriters are very uh, resilient. Um, there's a ton of work right now in the, the COVID-19 lockdown, actually, for freelancers, more than there usually is. It's just very interesting. Um, I was furloughed from a full-time gig that I had about two months ago and have since started kind of fending off freelance offers. So I didn't actually miss a beat in my income, which is really nice. Um, having that ability to switch between a full-time gig with an agency or in-house and switching to freelance, it's very, it'd be, you know, the, 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 the further along you get in your career, the easier that is to do. And honestly, uh, I, I don't want to say they're hundred percent recession proof, but freelance copywriting gigs tend to, you know, persevere a lot better than most other gigs do. So that's really nice. Yeah. And um, I think that you, you touched on it there, you know, it's, it's not kind of um, necessarily mutually exclusive, right? You can do, we've worked together for years. You've had different jobs throughout, but still been a writer for TCC, you know, still been, been our go-to guy, especially when it comes to brand naming, taglines, and that kind of super short form, creative Pablo uh, brain that we need you for. Um, so what would you say we've talked about freelancers pros and cons let's compare it to um let's say an in an in-house gig well yeah and actually let me let me cover the cons of freelancing really fast because I, th I think it's important of course, to yeah, do that um one of the things about freelance that uh you kind of have to learn how to get good at is if you're going to do it as a as like sort of your full-time gig um you know every monday you have to drum up that week's business so yeah you have to become a rainmaker and that that takes a little bit of practice but really it's about being a good person being easy to work with you know not being like a like a crazy egomaniac or anything um if clients like working with you they will refer you to other people um one of the things that i found that worked really well was just uh, you know reaching out randomly to people and creative directors or whoever and and offering to take them out for a couple of pints um, inevitably, you know, it's kind of awkward for the first pint, but then by the second pint, they've loosened up a little bit and they're like, you know, I don't have any work for you, but I have a friend who's working for this startup that they've been looking for marketing help, you know? So that kind of, that kind of helps, but you do have to drum up that work. And that's, that's almost a, a part-time gig on top of your full-time writing gig. Uh, the other thing is that for the work-life balance can get a little blurry. Um, you know, freelancers have the freedom to go for a bike ride at 10 in the morning but on a Tuesday, but they might also be working Sunday evening at nine, you know? Yeah. And that blurriness, you get used to it and it doesn't really bother you as much because you're delivering for your clients. 
and I've never had in my freelance days, I've never had like, um, you know, 70 hour weeks or anything like that. It's never been sweatshop. I've always, I've always had, um, really good sort of ability to tell my clients when to expect something and given myself plenty of time so that I don't have to, you know, work crazy hours. Uh, but you do sometimes work at odd times just because of the nature of the beast. Uh, and then I think another thing that, that when I started my company in London, I didn't realize I was going to have to be the accountant. I was going to have to be the, the rainmaker, uh, admin, you, you know, you're the account manager, you're the project manager, you're, you're everything. You're a full you're agency all of, in one. Yeah. So organizational skills, um, you know, learning how to use project management, so, like applications to, to keep you organized, all that kind of stuff, naming conventions for your files. Those are like little things that the admin stuff that you kind of have to learn. It's not really that daunting, but it's just, you know, especially creative minded people, sometimes that stuff's not second nature to us and we have to kind of force ourselves to learn it. But I, it's I kind very of much fun. agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then I think my last thing I would say is not a con necessarily, but just a piece of advice is as a freelancer, always have a rainy day fund. Um, obviously you want to save probably a third of your, of your, of your pay for taxes and whatnot, but also save a little money just because my first year working in London as a freelancer, I forgot that in Europe, everyone goes on holiday between middle of July and the end of August. And I did not plan for that. And so that, that time came up and it was crickets everywhere. My inbox was this like ghost town with a tumbleweed blowing through <laughs> it. And I was starting to get a little nervous, you know. But fortunately, I had a little bit of money saved up at that time. Um, but that is important. You, you, you do have to, you know, kind of prepare for the worst in some cases. I think that's an important life lesson for anyone. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when things like um, world pandemics seem to just appear yeah, out of nowhere. which happened, apparently. I didn't know that before, but yeah. I, I didn't either. I didn't know I was planning for this, but, you know, it's good to say for a rainy day, if that's what this yeah. is. Um, okay, let's let's talk, yeah, if we, let's, let's go into sort of in-house and just pros and cons of, of working in-house. Yeah, sure. I made up some notes here just because I didn't want to forget anything. Um, so the pros of in-house are uh, stability. Um, typically, Agencies are very volatile. Um, in-house, you're working for a big brand that has a lot of, you know, um, liquidity and is 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 a big established brand. And you know, typically, if they're bringing in um, the creatives, it's because or they're creating an in-house agency is they want to bring that creative energy into the brand rather than outsourcing it, right? So, yeah. so that's nice. Um, they have typically really good benefits and retirement plan and whatnot. That's probably a bit bit more of a concern in the U.S., but um, uh, there's, there's, I, I think there, there's a lot to offer creatives in terms of, of, uh, having sort of a stable long-term work plan. Um, yeah. there's also the nice thing about working on one brand is that there's a chance to build that brand, to be a part of, of creating this large brand uh, at an agency. You do a lot of tactical executions. You make a TV spot here or a website there. Um, whereas like when you work for a brand, you're doing ongoing work to build the brand. I, the, the last gig that I had, uh, the event marketing company, I was there for three and a half years and rebranded them twice, but it was more of an evolution of the brand, but that was a lot of fun. You know, I got to sit in a room and talk about how we make the brand yeah. evolve. It's really cool. You're part of um, that journey. Yeah. Yeah. And then the, I would say the work-life balance is pretty solid. You go home at five or six and sorry my toddler is uh, having a very spirited game of play-doh with my wife over the <laughs> <laughs> this covid life um yeah so i think that the the work-life balance is nice you typically don't work terrible hours i mean i worked a few 60 hour weeks uh, you know in-house but not that's not a regular thing for sure and then they pay a lot better than agencies do um and there's a lot of corporate perks you know travel and stuff like that that, that are very nice I would say the cons are um, because they're big corporations, there's a lot of politics. There's like little fiefdoms, you know, and, and every once in a while, you're just trying to get some information to write a thought piece. And it has, you have to go through like a hundred hoops. And that's, you know, you learn how to deal with that. It's especially easier to deal with seen as a bit more of a creative retirement plan um, because it is like the better pay and the more stable, you know, hours and, and, and uh, income and whatnot. Um, so that's nice. And then I think one of the things that, that, that can be um, 
kind of challenging is, uh, you know, in addition to the fact that corporate people can be kind of lame, like agency people listen to better music and wear cool sneakers and <laughs> dress cooler, you know, Great. corporate people are kind of dorky sometimes. But, but um, I think even more than that, I think that sometimes the, the, because of that dorkiness, the leadership doesn't quite get the value of creative. Mm. So occasionally, you know, if, if that, you know, if the philosophy of the brand isn't to let these guys be the experts, you can quickly become part of a production team, which is not a lot of fun because I've personally, as a writer, I like to be at the table, the strategy table. Yeah. I like to be able to say, this is what we should do with the voice of the brand and whatnot. Um, but if they don't really have, you know, if you don't have buy-in from leadership, it's like, here, write this intranet article here, write these three client emails here, write this, you know, and then you just a pair of hands and that's not, mm. it's not a ton of fun. It's not, it's not terrible. You're still writing, which is still fun. It's still better than, you know, filling in an Excel spreadsheet. But, you know, if you are, if you're hungry for having a seat at the table, I think sometimes that can be a detriment of the in-house game. Yeah. I suppose it's the luck of the job in a way, right? If you, if you, you don't have that variety there, as you said, as a, as you would as a freelancer and also as, you know, working for an agency. So if you're stuck in a job, I suppose this, this, uh, this it kind of applies to anyone in any job, you know, you're stuck, you, you might be stuck with some people that don't appreciate what you're doing. A new boss comes in, they don't appreciate the creativity and you know, it, it, it kind of stifles your creativity. It doesn't allow you to do what, what you really want to do as a copywriter. Um, so what about agency, agency life? Agency life um, is of the three, it's got the sexiest work. Um, I'm mean, just to give you an example. I spent three weeks in Sao Paulo, Brazil, shooting a TV commercial. Uh, the production company, as they do, they schmooze the agency people. So they took us out on like a graffiti tour, which was incredible. They took us to, to a carnival party, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And so it's a lot sexier work. Now, because of that sexiness, it attracts a very, very, very competitive, fiercely competitive environment because only one team gets to go do the sexy shoot in Brazil or wherever. Um, so the competitiveness can be, um, a little overwhelming at times and I'm not a naturally competitive person. So I had trouble with that environment. Yeah. I wasn't willing to play the game, you know, 10 hours a day just so I could, you know, shoot a TV commercial. So, so I struggled with that a little bit. If you are competitive, you'll do well. Um, but you, you, you will definitely take your lumps. I think it's a faster pace which is both a good thing and a bad thing. It's very exciting, but it's also, um, it can grind you down. If you go to an agency and you look around, there's not a lot of, not a lot of people over 40 um, because it's kind of, you know, with all due respect, a young man's game. It's long hours, um, a lot of stress, a lot of work, um, and a lot of dead ends, to be perfectly honest. I, in an agency, you can pitch, I mean, I would say on average, I pitched about, between 500 and 1,000 ideas a year, maybe two or three of them got produced. So if you are, uh, you know, sort of have a delicate ego, if you don't have thick skin, that can get old really fast. Yeah. Uh, and even if you do, it's, it's, it's emotionally exhausting to think all day long um, because the agency work is a lot more conceptual. Um, just to give you an idea, like, uh, we had this client at one agency called Daikin, which does Aircon. Um, they were coming into the U S market and they wanted a, a, a launch program. Uh, and so we, we decided on this website that had, um, this whole concept of never an uncomfortable moment. So with a Daikin Aircon unit in your home, you're never uncomfortable. Well, we wanted to come up with all these uncomfortable scenarios that would happen in a typical suburban American home that were very awkward, weird. I mean, just bizarre things, you know? And I mean, I think we ended up, we must have gone through about a thousand different scenarios. Maybe eight made it to the site, you know? So that can be exhausting, um, just coming up with ideas over and over and over. I think that the nice thing about agencies though is that it's a great place to do a little time. Um, a couple of years, five years, whatever. Looks great on your CV. You get big brands, you get to work on big brands and you get to learn an endeavor branding something like Jack Daniels or American Airlines is um, there's so many different moving parts to the marketing and advertising communications spectrum for a brand that size 
and being able to kind of have experience in all those different parts is great is great experience for a writer um i think uh and like i said uh the 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 colleagues you'll be working with the creatives are way hipper than you'll find anywhere else uh, a lot of tattoos and, and piercings and stuff but um the, i think the primary thing that's cool about an agency is that creatives are king uh the flip side of the coin to freelance where you have to do all the admin and accounting and everything is agencies are designed to support creatives making creative product Exactly. So and they're, they're like, just to give you an example, there were a couple of colleagues of mine who went to shoot a spot in Buenos Aires and arrived at the airport and didn't have like, they didn't know what they were doing, you know, and the producer who was right behind them kind of had to come up and she was like, Oh my gosh, this is the hotel you guys are staying at. And here's the, you know, <laughs> there's going to be a driver picking you up, you know, creatives are, are notoriously, especially agency creatives are notoriously kind of like cats. They're like, you know, kind of wander off or whatever. So there's whole departments that are, you know, in the agency that facilitate creatives doing their work. So it just also kind of creates an environment where, the, you know, the, the downside of that is that creatives can get a little bit big headed in agencies. And there's a lot of like, you know, extreme personalities and volatility. And especially with, you know, like, like in the States, like a Super Bowl television spot on the line, you can get the competitiveness can get a little ugly sometimes. Yeah. Um, but like I said, I think an agency is a fantastic place for a writer to do a stop or two along their career. And I, um, I think there's also, there's, there's different types of agencies as well. I suppose there's kind of marketing agencies, for example, where um, it might, you might be not involved as, in as much conceptual work as, let's say, an ad agency. But it, a slightly different ball game, I think, you know, there might be yeah. more long form, for example, marketing agency that's, or direct response, you know, if you want to kind of fine tune your direct response, uh, copywriting skills and, and, or sort of long form blogging, thought leadership, eBooks, that sort of stuff, then maybe a marketing agency would be a better fit. Um, yeah. Yeah. And also I, I would add to that, that, that I think, um, you know, um, there are agencies that are, kind of like creative or content factories almost. Um, one agency I worked with in London made websites, like I'm, they made like three or four websites a week. Mm. And obviously website, you know, making that many websites means they have a need for freelance copywriters. Yeah. And it was a, it was a, it, I forget what the town was where the agency was, but it was about an hour outside of London. And it was a room full of developers and designers and a creative director. And so I plugged in, you know, when I sat next to like two other copywriters who were just churning out copy for this stuff. And it was great. You know, I mean, honestly, uh, I can think of worse ways to earn a living, you know, sure. but that's a different, different type of agency to like a, a Wyden and Kennedy that does, you know, big gorilla stuff for Nike. Yeah. Um, it's funny. She's been quiet all day. <laughs> <laughs> she's excited. Yeah. She's yeah, just, she's she wants to learn about copywriting. <laughs> Future um, career maybe. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I think that, um, you know, depending on what kind of copy you like to do, and I would argue that you should try everything um, mm. because uh, there's so many different types of copy and some people are really, really good at, you know, the different types of copy. I know, I know copywriters who are, you know, um, they only write television and there's a market for that. There's a market for freelance copywriters who only write television yeah. efforts and that's great and they make a lot of money and they can do you know they can clean up with like six or seven jobs a year you know but that's also a very specific niche and you have to have had some pretty good experience to get to that point yeah uh, it's good i think at the beginning it's good to try everything but it's also and we talk about this in the course it's definitely not a bad thing to have a niche right you just become more sought after if you're the go-to person uh, in a certain industry or, or it, it, you know, who, who's that expert at a certain type or format of copy, um, which is a good segue to my next question, which is I want to talk about a bit about your tech copywriting experience. I know that you've covered many different industries, as we've said, but tech is one of them. It's obviously a growing industry, the tech and SaaS world. We have a lot of clients, a lot of SaaS platforms as clients you know i think it's 
it's it's a it's an industry and an area and a and a, a, a type of company that inherently needs copywriters. Not I mean I think obviously every brand does, but perhaps even more so because you know they're they're creating new technology that doesn't exist, right? That's why you create technology to 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 fulfill a certain need that's there and, and hopefully you don't have competitors, you know, you've got unique uh technology there and so and naturally it's been kind of created and built from the minds of developers who aren't necessarily the best at explaining to laymen or to 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 their target audience even tech savvy audience you know what the what the benefits of 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 their tech is like how how does it actually work what's the value proposition etc um so you know what do you think most what would you say most tech and SaaS brands struggle with when it comes to their copy? Well, I mean, typically their companies, there's a, there's an interesting angle to this because they're, you're seeing a lot more small businesses popping up around tech, which is really cool. This is the tech startup, right? It's, it's yeah. like sort of the, the dream, right? You go work at a big firm for a while coding and you learn some stuff and you have an idea and you have some friends that can help you build it. You get some money and you start your own thing. And then, and then um, you exit as soon as you can. <laughs> <laughs> you sell it off to somebody yeah. else, right? Well, well, you know, typically these guys get out there and realize that marketing is something they need to do. Yeah. Um, they don't know it. They're engineers or, or they're very analytically minded, right? So, so they don't understand how to market a product. Um, and so typically as a freelancer, you have to come in as an advisor. And there are times that you come into that situation and you are not handed anything. They're just like, can you make it, can you market this thing? And they don't have much for you. And you're like, okay, yeah. And you kind of have to sort of figure it out. But if you can, my, my suggestion is to guide them into a conversation where you can learn as much as you can about the, the audience first. And then the second thing that she just mentioned is the need. Um, all tech solutions, that's the word right there, it's a solution, it's, it's, it's scratching an itch, it's filling a need. Mm. Um, is, it, is it, you know, driven by fear or is it driven by, you know, the need to grow or what, what's the motivation? And once you get to that point, that will give you a, a huge leg up into how to, to market, you know, a piece of tech. As a freelancer, you also have to get really good at understanding or at least faking like you understand what the audience needs and what they're thinking. Um, and figuring out the right voice for the brand that will communicate that idea and that benefit to the audience without sounding like you don't know what you're talking about or sounding yeah. too arrogant or whatever. So I think it's, you know, it's hard to differentiate tech sometimes, but they're all, I mean, all those ideas, almost all of them across the board start with a need, yeah. you know, and, and that is, that is the fundamental way that you sell tech is to, to, to talk about that, that benefit. Um, Another thing that is an issue, I think, with tech companies is you get a bit of a kitchen sink mentality. You know, they create a, the product that has all these bells and whistles and they want to throw the, the entire lot at mm. the person who first visits their site, you know? Definitely. So you have to kind of guide them into saying, well, look, we need the welcome map first, which is the homepage. We need to establish what that benefit is and who we are as a, as a voice and a tone of voice and a character and a personality. You know, and then we'll get into that stuff, but we have to guide them naturally. So you also have to be kind of good at UX. So you have to understand what that care, what that audience journey is, the customer journey. Um, that's very helpful as well. But it's a matter of educating them, I think. Yeah, I think it's just overcrowded. Often, yeah, like you said, these sites can be overcrowded. Too many messages, too much going on, full of jargon, um, full of cliches often as well. You mentioned the word solution, which is quite interesting because, like you said, we are trying to understand what the need is and what the solution is. But I'd say try to steer away from using the word solution because it's just <laughs> overused, you know, like it is we are a global used. solution provider of um, solutions and services. You know, there, you can read these kind of cliched B2B um, websites and, and tech websites where you just come away from a page thinking, well, but what do you actually do? Not even like, well, and what's the benefit and what's the value? So it's really, um, I find sometimes analogies are quite useful for, 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 and metaphors for kind of painting that picture of this complex tech 
solution. Um, but what's what, what's the what's that quick benefit, that quick takeaway that they can get? Um, so on that note, yeah, do you have other sort of tips for humanizing tech talk, as we say, or um, being able to paint that picture, being able to 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 you know to really get a, 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 that value proposition or benefits across? Yeah, I mean, I think primarily first is getting an understanding of the product and the brand, if there is one, because sometimes there isn't a brand and they're looking to you, to you for help. Yeah. So, but in, you know, in any startup, in any tech company, there is an ethos in there somewhere, you know, and there's a reason that they started this thing. There's a reason they left the cushy stability of a, of a big corporate job and, and started their own thing and took this huge risk. So, so understanding the entire context of the of the product or service is really important and copywriters typically need to do a lot of reading and research the more you know the better you will be able to express what the benefit of the of the tech is um as i always say like you can never have too much background information just dump all the powerpoints and the pdfs you can on me i i, I will take all of it um, another thing that's important for the writer as well as the client is a good competitive analysis. Sometimes they have one for you and sometimes you need to show them that you've done that. You need to also make sure to work in um, research time in your billing. Um, give yourself a few hours to poke around because that's really, really important. Um, yeah. Another thing that works, I think, really well is interviewing the client. Um, that helps to get an idea of who they are, what they're looking for, what, what they're trying to bring to the world, you know, through their product. Um, you'll get a bit, you know, if you do it the right way and there's a, there's a science to interviewing, you can kind of op get them to open up a little bit about, uh, you know, why they're doing what they're doing. But and a, a good thing in general too, I think my last point for this would be uh, do background research on tech constantly. Like you should always be reading what other copywriters are doing. Mm -hmm. um, how they're describing other brands, um, different sectors, lifestyle, fashion, just pay attention. You know, like I, I, I notice I subscribe my, my inbox, my personal Gmail inbox is a disaster because I subscribe to everything. So I like to read copy and let's see what people are doing. Yeah. And sometimes that inspires you, you know, or sometimes you see what you shouldn't be doing. Um, but with tech, it's good to get out there and see because you'll start to like, as you said, you'll see a lot of the same words. Solutions is, is, completely overdone, you know? Um, so, so that you'll start to notice some trends like that, that you can kind of avoid to sound fresh and interesting. I think that, um, yeah, competitive and uh, analysis is, is, it's an interesting, it's a good point. I mean, as a copywriter, um, doing that kind of strategic work is, is definitely an area where as a freelancer, where you should be able to obviously charge more, right? Because, there's, there's just the production side of things, the creative, you know, if, if a client has a really powerful brief and they've done that kind of analysis and they, they answer, you know, fill out your discovery sheet and they com confidently, um, then, you know, you might just be expected to write um, after a bit of research. But if they haven't, if there's a, if there's a gap there, which we usually find with most clients, um, there's an opportunity for a freelancer to, essentially not just make some more money but give more value which is a good exchange for both parties and you know this happens to us all the time you know today even I had a, a compatibility call as we call it call them um, and you know they were looking for a website copy rewrite and there were solutions was definitely a word that was dropped around this b2b website a lot I mentioned it I said look we're a frank uh, agency we, we 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 tell it how it is <laughs> and there's a lot of cliches on your website um and so i'm glad that you've, you're looking to, to kind of redo it um but i could see sort of immediately that they probably hadn't done a lot of work in the brand strategy area or in competitor analysis or looking at their competitors and saying oh this is their tone of voice let's kind of zig while the industry is zagging but make make sure it's relevant for our audience um, etc um so yeah you know what we did is talked about strategy and said okay look this is great we can do all of that what we do with a lot of clients is actually help them dig into these things you know try to help them understand and and identify a value proposition and help them kind of establish brand values and personality and um 
and essentially it's an upsell, right? It's an upsell that they usually go for because it makes a ton of sense and it's really, really valuable. You know, we're, we, you, you don't have to do a huge amount of extra work, but you definitely want to be charged for that work. And in order for you to do a really, really great job with the copywriting side of things, you sort of need that work done somewhere along the line, whether it's you or someone else. Um, so, you know, it, and as I said, it's, it's a way of making more money as a freelancer, um, being more valuable as a freelancer, being more sought after as well, because you, you offer all of these things. So it's really interesting to tie the strategy work in with the, the copywriting sort of content creation work. Um, let me, let me just chime in for a second there. Cause you bring up a really good point that, that adding more value as a freelancer, um, you should always see yourself as a partner yeah. to, to the clients, right? You, you don't just want to take the money and run. You actually want what they're doing and what they're trying to do to succeed. So, you know, bringing that value, like the guys, I made you this competitive analysis, you know, if they haven't had that and you've bring that to them, suddenly you've opened this whole door for them, you know, mm -hmm. and getting, you know, fulfilling the needs of a client and going a little bit above and beyond pays dividends down the road because they'll remember that. And I've worked with clients who I didn't hear from after the job was done for seven years and they pop back up again. Um, so, you know, relationship building is your primary tool, I think, in succeeding as a copywriter. It really is important to just be a good person and a good partner. And you'll have clients that are, that are, are tricky, but I've actually had better experience as a freelancer with clients than I had working for an agency or in-house. Um, that relationship goes a long way. Definitely. Relationships, so important. We, we did another interview with um, another copywriting agency founder, and we just kept talking about um, what you mentioned today, which was be likable, be a likable person. There's all these kind of divas out there that you know throw their toys out of a pram as soon as like they don't get good feedback oh what do you mean but this but 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 um it it, it doesn't work well for you in the long run so just being likable you know being I, I love the, the the tip you gave taking people out for a pint you know anything you can do like that that's what we call account management right as an agency we have to do tons of that but we've got an account manager for it right so we you know we send we send gifts we send cupcakes with our logo on to our favorite clients you know, you might not need to go that far as a freelancer, but what can you do to, to, to head in that direction? How can you go the extra mile to be more likable and to offer more value? And, and like you said, if you can do something like a competitor analysis, it doesn't have to be hugely in depth, just a quick look at five, uh, five competitors with a table of, you know, um, strengths, weaknesses, what their value proposition is, what their tone of voice is, and you know identifying it if they haven't done it is so useful it's it's that's why strategists charge a lot of money because it's extremely valuable you know everything they can then build on will make more sense and will work harder for them and will increase their revenue so just that little piece of strategy work can go a long way yeah and also the the competitive analysis uh with certain clients there's a subconscious effect where they'll look at their competitors and go, well, we aren't doing any of this. Like we don't have a value proposition. We don't have any, you know, and it helps you to kind of sell in the idea that you, you need to do this stuff for your brand. So yeah, it's competitive analysis is a really, if you can get, if you can work that in there, absolutely. It's, it's very valuable. The one. So I'm just going to say here that um, I can't remember off the top of my head, if we actually have that within uh, actually i'm pretty sure we do right we've got a competitor analysis within our course materials and i'm pretty sure we've taught how to do one if not um i will definitely drop a link <laughs> below this video to an example of what that looks like so everyone knows and aren't just thinking what the hell are they talking about what is a competitor analysis um so i want to get on to the subject of super 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 short form copy um essentially Brand naming and taglines. Um, I won't say these are, you know, if you work for an agency, an ad agency um, or a branding agency, for example, or freelance for a, a branding agency, it, it's something that you might come across. Um, I'd say that it won't generally, if you're starting out, it's not going to be a huge part of, of the mix of things that you do as a copywriter, but um, it's a very interesting part. It can be a very challenging part. You know, it's, it, I, I often say to clients, 
you know, you, you, you put a high value on that for, for starters, you know, a brand name and a tagline, that's kind of stuck with them for, for the foreseeable future. Um, it's very, very important to get right. And even though it's three words or one word, um, it's, you know, it's a lot harder to write those three words than it is to write a 2000 word article because you only have three words to say so much. And the, the, the naturally the client will be very precious over it because they want it to be right. So you are someone that we've always gone straight to and, and brought into the equation whenever there's been taglines, brand naming. In fact, a project we're working on right now um, because you've got this natural skill perhaps at the, the creative side at kind of at that super short form copy. Um, or maybe you have some incredible process, which I hope you're going to reveal for us now. You know, can you talk us through how you um, how you tackle a tagline, for example? Oh, I like to start with a lot of screening first um, because it's, it's stressful. Are, are we frozen? Are we good? Did you we're hear good that? Now. We're good. Um, I think that taglines and brand names are. Um, they are such a strange and unique writing project for any writer. Of all the writing that any writer can do, whether it's fiction or anything, tagline and brand naming has to be the weirdest. And it's a, it's a really acquired skill that uh, you just have to, the more experience you have, the better you'll get. But it is kind of terrifying. Everything has been done. So it's very hard to find something new. What I would say is the best thing to do is open up a blank document or a page in your notebook and just start writing. Write and write and write and write and write and write. And the first two hours of work are going to be terrible. So, and I would recommend this for any writing project. You have to step away from it. Uh, I think with taglines and brand names, you need to step away more than you would with long form. Um, it's always good to step away from your work and get a, a night's sleep on it. So if you're, you know, starting out as a freelancer, this goes for any gig, try and schedule enough times so that you have a couple of nights before your deadline so that you can sleep on it. It's always good to look at your copy with fresh eyes because you will see things that you can't see when you're entrenched. Mm. With taglines and um, brand names, I think let's start with taglines. I would say it, you need to figure out what the benefit is. Um, you know, some of the, the greatest taglines in history, like just do it for Nike. Nike is an apparel company for like, like exercise apparel, right? Just do it implies get out there and be the best you, right? And wear our stuff while you're doing it. Um, does it say anything about shoelaces or, you know, air cushions in your shoes or anything? No, it doesn't say any of that. It offers a very emotional benefit. That's what the tagline needs to do. The tagline is not about what the product or service or company does. It's about what they provide for as in terms of a value for the customer. Mm. So thinking about it like that, you can tend to get a bit more poetic with the tagline, which is really nice. Um, it's, it's writing that has a bit more of an emotional weight to it. And that's really nice, but it is very stressful because you have to just keep writing and keep writing and keep writing and keep writing. And as you write, you should have, 20 browser windows open with all kinds of assorted stuff. It doesn't matter, it doesn't even have to be marketing related. Just go read some articles, go find some creative websites that have cool stuff on them and just let your brain go in every direction it possibly can because if you are just looking at a notebook in a coffee shop, you're gonna get stuck into kind of a little trench. It's really good to go somewhere, go to a museum, you know, um, go see a movie, just let your brain go in all different directions. And it's a weird exercise because um, you are writing in pieces. I find that when I'm in the middle of a tagline project, I'll be, you know, uh, waiting in line at the bank or something and I'll pull out my phone and write down a couple of things I had just thought of because I saw something, you know, like a red balloon in the bank or something or a red lollipop and I'll go, oh wait, what about this, you know? And so inspiration for, for writing in general, but especially for taglines and brand names can come from anywhere. So do not close any of that stuff out. Let all that stuff in. Let it all rattle around in your head and eventually things will start to 
talk about it. Uh, you know, it gets, it gets easier and you get a bit more formulaic with it over time, which is a good thing because you kind of learn what kind of mindset and in, you know, environment you need to be in to do this kind of project. Um, but I think, yeah, the, I, think, I think having that pause, you know, having that break is such a key uh, piece of advice. Like I've found with, with taglines that, um, yeah, you get a second wind and then a third wind. And then, you know, you think you've explored all options as though there were such a thing. There are infinite options, really, in the end of the day. Um, maybe not infinite, but there's a hell of a lot. Um, and, you know, you've gone through and your brain's working towards, you know, for, for me, I, I usually start by looking at different types of taglines, you know, um, and, it, and going down these different sort of rabbit holes in a way um, of, of and getting inspiration from other famous taglines that are there. Like you said, that might be one tab open, like what the top hundred taglines out there um, and looking at the different types, you know, there can be more abstract ones. There can be ones that are more kind of do what it says on the tin. There are the, there are the ones that the action ones and then the question ones and just try, you know, you try different ones and, and in, infuse that kind of main benefit or that main essence of the brand into it. But you'd kind of, you think you've explored everything, but then when you have a break and come back, you're like, oh, here's another, here's another idea, which sort of almost like a Google search, you know, sort of triggers all kinds of other uh, ideas uh, off the back of it. Um, so having that, a, a pause for a creative pause is, is really important. Um, yeah, I think also, um, you know, another place that I, I go, if we're getting tactical about it, uh, I like to open goodreads.com, which is the, the site for people who read to talk about books, right? Um, they have uh, quotes. They'll have quotes from famous authors and famous people. Quotes are a great place to get inspiration as well. Um, typically, they're a lot longer, but there may be certain words or emotions or something in there that, that, that help. And then another cheat that I like is when you come up with the benefit or the value is do a little thesaurus search. See what, uh, how, what other words are used to describe that, right? Um, it's a mishmash of all these different things coming together. And then one last thing I'll add is that I literally will come up with two or three additional tags as I'm putting together the deck with the tagline to send to you guys, right? I, it always happens. And writers tend to be, like uh, the joke is in ad agencies is that writers get three weeks to do a project, will screw around for two weeks and, and six days and then freak out on the last day and write something amazing, you know? <laughs> The pressure actually That's how does. my brain works for sure. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 there is something about a writer under pressure will do really great work, you know, and, and that's kind of the thing with the taglines. One last thing I'll leave uh, with the tagline uh, and brand names as well is presentation is really key when you send it to a client. And, you, you know, you guys are really good at this is that you have, you have a template for presenting these things. Taglines and brand names. If you just send them a list on a Word doc, they're they're not. They're, they're, it's going to be a mishmash in their brain. Yeah. Um, put each one individually on its own slide in a in a little presentation deck. Make it look nice. Use a nice font. Use a nice like a black background is always good with yeah. white pops out. Um, and then maybe in the notes a little explanation about why why. You I think that with. yeah, the rationale you could do in a in a in a second because you've put that thought into it and I think the rationale really helps because like you said if you send you can put so much work it's so much time and work oh so much time and work into these taglines but if you just present it on a document the client might think that you've spent half an hour on it you know but if you present them nicely with a rationale that again just takes a minute um yeah it, it's the way to do it um awesome really really good advice wisdom from you Pablo uh, really appreciate all of that um, and you know the community will are, are lucky enough to have you in there giving feedback uh, on all the tasks they're doing so you know if anyone has any specific questions off the back of this interview for Pablo please you know ask him he's in there to help yeah feel free to reach out um, uh, I always have a soft spot for writers uh, because I've been there uh, especially the ones that are starting out first time so I'm happy to answer any questions or provide any advice or guidance you guys might need awesome thank you so much again Pablo and thank you. Uh, catch up soon cool Cheers. take care